that's just great. Deep within a forgotten forest, beneath the ominous canopy, is a beast of questionable origins. Beneath this, an abominable clutch of recalcitrant hatchlings. Beneath this nest, a mouth of a cave to destinations unknown. Beneath this, a sepulchre belonging to an unknown drow warrior. And beneath this, a cave. And it is within this cave that a lone wizard finds a solid iron sarcophagus, the true burial place for a drow warrior. Magical means are used to open this chest, and therein lies the body of a drow warrior perfectly preserved, however entombed, in a corrosive green acid. A few spells later, and the corpse is removed, only for the wizard to find that it is no longer perfectly preserved, but just skeletal remains. Taking care to avoid the corrosive acid, he carefully pours over the contents of the sarcophagus. So as to not desecrate the dead, he returns the body to the sarcophagus, only to find it perfectly preserved once more. With treasures in hand, he seals the casket and leaves the drow warrior to his final resting place. So what I just described to you was a session that I played with a good friend of mine, and I thought that this would be a fun piece to make. Even though after the fact, I thought it would be something nice to kind of have in my repertoire. It kind of became a cool conversation piece, and the entire session was kind of focused around solving this, how to open this magically sealed iron sarcophagus. So I thought that it would be kind of a fun piece to make, and I figured it would be kind of easy until I started this. I had made it a few inches long, and I started carving out the inside of it, but my issue was that I wasn't sure how to get all this foam out of the center of it without damaging the entire piece. I considered drilling it out, and at first I tried cutting it out with the razor blade and X-Acto knife, and I wasn't really making much progress. This is about an inch and a half thick, so I didn't want to punch holes in it, and I didn't want to tear it in half, only to have to put it back together. So I tried using pliers to sniff it out, and carving it out with a razor blade might be best? But it took me a few attempts to kind of figure out the best way to do this without destroying the exterior walls of this piece. I tried taking slices out, I kind of tried chipping things away, it wasn't really working out, and I was having a really difficult time from the get-go. I was really unsure what to do because I could get the top portions out very easily, but then it came to my attention that getting the lower stuff would be really difficult without hurting the rest of the peak. I considered using a drill, but there was problems with that as well. Drill bits are round. This is square. So how do I get the corners? What do I do? Also, how do I keep myself from going all the way through? There was really no way for me to measure it. I went to go look at my tools, and that's when I figured out something crazy. I came back with Allen wrenches and my drill. So I decided to chuck one up and just see what would happen. Great. Perfect. I started slow at first, but I found that this is actually a very effective way to carve out the inside of something without destroying anything. I was able to keep the drill very straight and very even, and I had a lot of control over the RPMs and where I wanted it to go. So giving it a little consideration, I reapproached it from a different angle to see if I could do something to make it go faster, and this didn't work. I ended up destroying one of the edges of the piece, but I figured I'd be able to fix that later on instead of starting all over again and recutting pieces. So I went back to the original configuration, and I decided to just take it slow and careful. I tried it again, and I quickly discovered that I was a human CNC machine. And I gotta be honest with you, after some time doing this, this was very fun. This was very satisfying to be able to slowly carve away pieces of foam with this drill and an Allen wrench. Truthfully, I felt very juvenile. I was having a really hard time not laughing just at the fact that this was actually working and that it was working so well. I still didn't know what I was going to do when it came to the edges on the two sides, but at least on the two longest sides I was able to get straight lines and carve most of it out.
as I continued doing this though, it wasn't until I was waist deep in this that I realized that there was another problem here. Is that this chips off very small pieces of foam and this gets everywhere. And with the static electricity, it's clinging to me, as you can see on my hand there. And it got into everything. Later on when I cleaned this up, I used my vacuum cleaner and it was hard to get it off the vacuum cleaner. It was hard to get off my hand. It was hard to get off my desk. It was hard to get off out of the vacuum cleaner. It was like a whole thing. But for anybody who's wondering, I didn't have to use a very large Allen key for this, and I will probably do this again and or find other items that I could chuck up in a drill and spin at dangerous speeds to carve out foam. I'm actually very eager to try this again on something else. Uh, I just need to think of a reason to do it. Was this easier than carving? Absolutely. Was it therapeutic? Absolutely. Was it neater? I don't think so, but that's okay. Uh, not too much longer. At this point I was almost to the bottom of the box and I started using various screwdrivers and blades to start carving out the edges in order to make it flush. Unfortunately at the bottom I couldn't make it flat or smooth but I had a plan for that. With the bottom carved out I decided working on the lid. I described it as a iron sarcophagus that was perfectly smooth on all sides with a near invisible seam. I know I'm not going to be able to achieve that with hand cut lines. But I wanted to get as close as possible within reason without dedicating a ton of time to it. From here I take a wire bristle brush with plastic bristles, not brass, and I begin to sand it down a little bit, and this is the inside of the top of the lid. So I'm not super concerned about this being perfect. I didn't want this to be a long build, and ironically it did, but I wanted to make this quickly, and if I wanted perfection, I probably wouldn't have even done it in the first place, knowing that there was a lot of straight seams and straight lines. Using my X-Acto, I carefully cut around the edges, on the sides, and on the surface of it in order to cut what is effectively a square ring out of it, and the idea is that this lid will fit into the bottom portion. Ooh, that's nice. Once I get this figured out, I clean it up a little bit and I trim down the edges just to help make it fit a bit better and a bit more smoothly. What I don't want is when I paint this, I don't want the paint rubbing off every time I open and close it. So I want it to be a little loose fitting and not too tight. From here, I move on to the hinges. I had a piece of cardboard from something, I don't remember, that had built in hinginess to it. So I thought that I could trim some of this up and make a couple pieces that could go inside both pieces so that the hinges were hidden, but were also not going to wear out over time. I decided that the best way to go is like a typical door. I figure two small hinges will be good, and it won't occupy a lot of space. This part was a little tricky, because I had to make multiple pieces to try out, and I ended up destroying a few, and in order to make them strong enough and wide enough, but not too long, so they weren't sticking out everywhere. It took me a couple attempts to finally find them. Moving on, I needed to make holes in the lid and the bottom of the casket in order to fit the hinges in. I know just the way. Nah, I'm just kidding. I ended up using a screwdriver and my X-Acto knife again in order to carve out these small slits that literally only had to be paper thin in order to fit these hinges inside of them. When doing this, I was effectively making an already thin wall half as thin by creating these seams inside, so I had to be very careful as to not break them. A little playing around and I was able to get these hinges in to kind of do a dry run to figure out how well it would fit. I then got it in, and I was pleased in the direction that this was going. 
I then started cutting out the slits in the bottom portion and carefully removed those as well. It took me a little while and I eventually ended up using needle nose pliers, the screwdriver, and a couple other things to get it, but I eventually got it and I was pretty happy with the result. From here, I fixed the little piece that I broke off with my initial drilling experimentation. After that dried, I was ready to begin with the base coat. This base coat, if you don't know, is made with a mixture of Mod Podge and black acrylic paint. The black acrylic paint allows you good coverage to know where you've already put this covering in, and the Mod Podge gives it some toughness once it dries. Here's a free pro tip. If you're using XBS foam that is used from a larger piece of foam, they often have the manufacturer's labels on them, and so you have to really give these a really good covering. Otherwise, I have seen this show up through base coats and through paints, and you'll have weird letters going through your project. Using an earth brown as a base, I start mixing colors in order to get that rust color that I want. I didn't want a shabby rust color, but more of a thin layer over the entire surface of it that was a little more even. So I started playing around with some reds and yellows and starting to find some that I liked. And so I ended up using these as my main coats and then as my dry brushing colors. In my estimation, the reds mixed with the browns didn't really get me too far. And I found later on that oranges mixed with browns are a better way to go for a lighter rust color. It was kind of nice having a hollowed out area for me to stick my fingers and I didn't have to touch any of the surface area of the portion I was painting. After I do the bottom, I do the top. Again, making sure I'm covering any leftover manufactured labels that are sticking out through the primer. I intentionally did not paint the inside of the sarcophagus the brown color because I was going to fill that with a greenish color. The idea I had when I played this in a game was that it was going to be a translucent yellowish green acid that resided inside of this thing. And so my thought here is if I use a clear acrylic of some sort that I can make some sort of darker to lighter gradient inside the sarcophagus to kind of give it that depth. I waited for the dark green to dry, and then I came back with a dry brush to do a lighter shade, after which I would come back and do a even lighter shade. While the insides were drying, I decided to come back and touch up the outside, start applying my dry brushes of the darker and lighter colors in order to get those different layers on. Between the inside and the outside, as well as the lid, I kept hopping back and forth between the three, allowing one to dry while I painted the other. By the time I got around back to the first one, it was usually dry enough for me to start touching up. Once I get to the second color of the green in the bottom of the sarcophagus, I am really pleased with the texture at the bottom, and this is where I couldn't shave out or make smooth from the drilling, and I'm beginning to get really excited for this, and I can't help but keep sticking it together to take a peek and see what it might look like at the end. So I apply another dry brushing layer, and this color is really satisfying. I apply an even lighter green as the final dry brushing for the acid area, and I'm really happy with the way these colors turned out. Because I couldn't smooth out the bottom, it left a really good texture for me to work with. Now, as you might know, there is a acrylic water kit that you can buy from Walmart, and this makes for really good water effects, but however, it doesn't mix very well with paint, and so I wanted to mix paint to get the color, because I didn't have any sort of food coloring or anything on hand, and so I put some PVA glue and some tacky glue in some medicine cups, and I allowed them to dry for a few days, and it did take a few days even for these little amounts to dry. And the tacky glue came out looking really good, actually. I was very surprised. And it had a nice ripply effect, and it 
dried most of the way through. And so I decided to use that, and I figured mixing it with a little bit of lime green paint, uh, just a bit, would tint it enough. I read online that you could do this as long as you use a very little amount. However, I don't know exactly what that ratio is, so I'm kind of spitballing here. Now, some of you might be thinking that I'm wasting tacky glue here. Um, I bought this at Dollar Tree. It's a little two ounce bottle, and I ended up using maybe an ounce of it for the whole project. So I'm not really sad that I used a lot of it, and I quickly realized that I actually needed more of it, so I decided to use what I had to put my hinges in and let those dry before I decided to put the acid into the sarcophagus. It's at this point I begin to get nervous because it's the point of no return once I put this in. I start applying some in and I quickly realize that I need much more of this. Also, I need some better way to scoop this out of my It's not working. So I mix up some more and I try smoothing it out just to kind of see what my fill line is going to look like. And you can see by the green paint I have on the inside there, my intended depth. I end up mixing a bit more and putting some more in. I was kind of hoping for more translucent spots if I mix in a little bit of plain white. I then mix some more because I needed more and I try to get it in and smooth it out a bit more. I then mix some more and put it in because this is not going as far as I thought it would. So I try to smooth it out without getting too messy. I then mix some more. After this, all that's left is to glue the lid back on and then let it dry for the next two weeks. And this is the final part. I don't know if I would call this a success. This isn't quite what I wanted, but I think this is going to be a pretty cool piece anyway. Even if I can't use this for its intended purpose, I could always fill this in with a bit of treasure on top. Just a little covering, and this could be a really sweet chest. Tre treasure trove. The acid inside, it actually, it's kind of hard to tell on camera, it actually sunk down a lot. You can see where it was originally and then just how far it went down. The tacky glue, it hardened up really well, but it didn't, um, it didn't retain its mass very well, much less than I thought it would. But otherwise, a great little project. Didn't take too terribly long, besides the tacky glue drying. If you can find an alternative to that, I think you'd be set. Just don't maybe add paint to tacky glue if you're trying to make something transparent. Hey, thanks for coming and watching this video, guys. If you've made it this far, I appreciate you sticking around. Why don't you hit that subscribe button, the like button, and share with your friends. Tell me in the comments what you think about this project and what you think I should do next. Thanks a lot.